All right, hello and welcome. Take these off. So as you will quickly find out, I'm trying a couple of new things today. Um, and I'll give a whole list in a second, but you can already see the chat kind of floating in here. Uh, oh, good to go. Okay, cool. That's fine. Um, so you can see the fl uh, chat floating in here in the game. So I tried some different placements, and I hope it's readable throughout, but we'll uh, we'll play with it. Let me get myself all teed up here. Um, so a couple of different changes that uh, are in place for this week. So one thing, I... Uh, finally decided to just go for a slightly faster internet package. And so I'm excited to be streaming in uh, 1080p today. So I don't know how different that is on the on the receiving side. Um, on the uh, on my app side, where it shows me what, what in theory everyone's seeing, it looks much cleaner, but well, it's hard to tell. Um, so hopefully that's a, hopefully that's a good one. And... We'll kind of start off like normal here. A little bit of an intro to the stream while everyone gets settled. So thank you, Fractals, for posting up those uh, bits of information, the flight plan, uh, start time. So it's about, let's see what time it is here. It should be about 7 o'clock. Yep, 7.02 a.m. And uh, if you'd like to follow along, then Fractals also posted up that other, other option for it. So a uh, bit of information. So each week, we pick a new national park to explore together. This week, we're exploring Mammoth Cave National Park. For those of you with a copy of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, I've included a flight plan for you to follow along today. I see flying singer on the runway, uh, some other people floating around. Uh, I've also researched the park in preparation and added any additional uh, information with sources to the National Park Wikipedia page. Why Wikipedia? There's two main reasons. It's a way to make sure that the facts are checked by others, and it's a way to give back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour here together. To that end, if you notice anything that uh, could be better clarified or or is incorrect, please help us fix the Wikipedia pages. As the wiki, community often, as the wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. You'd think after a couple of weeks I would really have that just down, but a little bit. You, you feel nervous even though there's actually no one in front of me. No. Uh, also, we'll vote near the end on the next national park to explore together. So look out for that and other posts coming in the chat. And feel free to ask questions or post thoughts along the way. I love, I love chatting with all of you. Small disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be baking, taking full advantage of the simulator today, so please don't try this at home. And without further ado, I'm Jules Altus, and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Mammoth Cave National Park. So first things first here, let me get myself flying. So I'm in a uh, Pipistrol aircraft, which is this nice little uh, high-wing plane. And the... Um, the Latin word for bat is uh, pipistrellus. So I posted in the Discord asking if people knew that. I didn't... Well, anyway, yeah. Um, pip pipistrellus. When I saw that that uh, connection, I was curious if that was intentional. And it turns out the company who makes the plane chose it because it's, their original models looked like a bat when it was flying. It was a little bit more like a, a hang glider than anything. I'll get myself rolling here. Uh, so a couple other administrative updates while I'm taking off. So I mentioned the 1080p streaming. I also, you'll notice as I get into the Chrome part that I, uh, where I was putting up different pictures and stuff, that I have kind of changed the format and the layout a little bit. So let me know what you think of that. Uh, hopefully it's a bit more engaging with a bit bigger screen for the game. So it, it's less uh, Chrome all on one side of the screen. And then the other thing is Fractals and I got together this weekend and tried to get the polls working. So hopefully that will be smooth as butter today, he says, attempting to jinx it as much as possible. But really, really, hopefully it'll it'll work fine. We were playing with it a bit. Oh, hey, there you go. Look, shut up. Okay, so have you ever been to this national park before? Yes, in the last 10 years. Yes, once upon a time. Or not yet. Give people a second to vote on that. That's kind of cool. I can actually see the real-time results as they come in. I have been to Mammoth Cave National Park before, uh, quite a while ago now, but it was very fun. Oops, let me flip this over. Okay, so I also, so typically when I fly, I'll set up my autopilot before I go, but I figure some, some folks would like to see how I do this. So just if it's useful, I'm gonna switch over to GPS mode here, and then I flip my 
uh, autopilot to navigation, so it'll just take me to the next point. And then today I'm just going to have it hold an altitude of uh, 1500, because that's all I need. And then hit my autopilot and hopefully just start flying along at beautiful sunrise in Kentucky. Swim my way out here. You can look out the window here. The I picked this airport because it's right over this sort of river lake structure. There's a couple of them that will fly over today. It's really, really pretty, and especially in the morning sunrise. Good place to be. Okay, so for uh, okay, Fractals is, is explaining it. So to get the uh, the vote to work, you have to do a exclamation point vote and then whatever letter. Okay, so we have. It sounds like one a uh, couple of votes that that didn't go through. So um, remember to do that exclamation point. I know it's a new system, so we're we're all kind of learning it as we go. The uh, Mammoth Cave, though, I have been there many years ago. I remember some of the rooms. I wish I had known what you're all about to learn today when I went. So hopefully, uh, for those of you who haven't been, it'll be a, a useful sort of overview of the park. We're actually going to start today's flight by flying all the way out to Fort Knox, because there's a, a model in the game of Fort Knox, so it's kind of fun. And if we flew directly over the park, it would be like a 10-minute flight. So be a bit of a detour to start off with here. Technically it was two for B. Okay, so which is uh, yes once upon a time. Okay, thanks Fractals. How was that sizing working on the on the screen for, for font too? Let me know about the, the pole piece. That'll be that'll be useful enough. So Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave National Park is an American national park in west central Kentucky, encompassing portions of Mammoth Cave, the longest cave system known in the world. Since the Oops, sorry, just a moment here as my plane starts to descend rapidly. Never a good sign. I actually just started learning how to fly. Uh, this is a mixture, or I'm sorry, a propeller control. And the trainer planes that you would typically fly and the ones that I learned on, you don't have a propeller control. But in most modern planes, you would have, or not most, but a lot of them, you'll have a, a way to control the, the rotation speed of the propeller. And so I just started learning on one of those a couple weeks back as I try to make sure that this plane continues flying itself. Oh, fractals, okay. Fractal says it's good, just big up on top. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Right, then I'll bring this back to. That should be good. Unfortunately, no friendly ranger video about Mammoth Cave today. Uh, they have quite a few videos of different concerts that have occurred in the cave. So if you want to go watch uh, singers or bands play there, that's uh, that's something that they have a lot of. But no, no videos up today. The, uh, since the 1972 unification of Mammoth Cave with the even longer system under Flint Ridge to the north, the official name of the system has, become, has uh, been the Mammoth Flint Ridge Cave System. The park was established as a national park on July 1st of 1941, a World Heritage Site in 1981, and an International Biosphere Reserve in 1990. This is a park with a lot of accolades, and they have a whole page on their park website uh, listing all of those different accolades. And well-deserved, I would say. So the park is more than uh, 52,000 acres large, and the Green River runs through that park, with a tributary called the Nolan River feeding into the green just north of there. So let me show you that on the map real quick. And we'll fly over all those areas. So here's the Nolan River Lake and Nolan River. And then it feeds through the Green River, which will fly along most of the time. So you'll see that flight path passes right through. Mammoth Cave is the world's largest known cave system with more than 400 miles of surveyed passages, and it's nearly twice as long as the second largest cave system, which is an underwater cave in Mexico. The purpose of Mammoth Cave National Park is to preserve, protect, interpret, and study the internationally recognized biological and geological features and processes associated with the largest known cave system in the world. The park's diverse forested, karst landscape, 
uh, the Green and Nolan Rivers, and extensive evidence of human history, and to provide and promote public enjoyment, recreation, and understanding. The other piece of it, as I was researching this park, that was really hard to get my head around was what does kind of angle our way out here. We can look over the landscape a bit. I was trying to get my head around what does 400 plus miles of cave system actually look like? And so I couldn't find anything online that was a good modern diagram. There was one that was some 40 years old or so, and then there was another one that was 100 years old uh, when they first started exploring the cave. But there was nothing that, that kind of had the latest. And so I emailed the National Park uh, directly and tried to see what other resources they would get. And they sent over this. So this is the Mammoth Cave system, and I have it, I'll have it overlaid in the park when we fly around, I can show you. But this is sort of what it looks like uh, as a network of tunnels. And it's in three, three dimensions, so it's, you know, when you flatten it to 2D, it looks kind of overlapping, but this is sort of the, the system itself. And when people go exploring, they'll walk down these different tunnels and try and find new ways to, to connect them. And you'll see some of these connections here where when they talk about part of the Mammoth Cave system being part of, connected to the Flint Ridge, there's this single passage that would connect the two, but that's all you need to make it a continuous cave. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I like this one more because the you can see the chat in uh, in the corner too, which is kind of nice. I'll flip back though. So how does a cave system this large even form? That takes us into our first topic, which is karst topography. So you may have heard that word in the park purpose statement. They mentioned a karst landscape. Uh, fractals, any luck with the first poll here? I know I kind of put, oh, nice. Hey, look at that. OK, so where can you find karst landscapes? Is it basically only in Kentucky or nearly everywhere around the globe? Or fractals knows a guy, and he can take you there real cheap if you pay in cash. <laughs> immediately <laughs> one vote for fractals oh that's funny fractals vote nice oh i can see who's voting for stuff too that's pretty fun also flying singer i see you off my wing there hello hello pop out of the plane while people vote on that When we get near the park, you'll see kind of the rolling landscape. I'll point that out a little bit more when we get closer. This is a pretty good, pretty good overview. All right, so we'll, while people vote on that one, karst topography, the reason we're talking about that is, is like they mentioned the, the park purpose, it's to protect that karst landscape. And the second reason that I'm excited to talk about it today is 2021 is the International Year of Caves and Karst. So this year, it's an international affair. And actually what we'll talk about in just a minute is karst landscapes, so I suppose this kind of ruins the the poll here, um, but they are found nearly everywhere on the globe, so a good vote for number B on, or for letter B on that. They are an international occurrence, and they're something that many countries around the world have interesting and unique landscapes because of. Let's talk about why that is in just a second here. <laughs> Not Island says no flying. Oh, you can see the chat. Uh, I don't have to read it anymore. That was the other reason I did that, so I didn't have to, to keep verbalizing what was what was said. So, uh, Nyland, sorry you couldn't make it, but uh, glad you're here. At least uh, learn a little bit about the park. Always been happy. All right, fractals. Uh, well, that's okay. So, karst topography. So, a karst landscape. Oh, here we go. So. Sorry, my plane started turning on me. It was doing that a little bit when I was practicing too, and I couldn't figure out why. It seemed to correct itself, but uh, hopefully I don't just tip over. This is the difference between a simulated plane's autopilot and a real plane's autopilot, is a simulated plane's autopilot goes through many less years of testing. I'm certain of it. So a karst is a topography formed from the uh, dissolution of soluble rocks such as limestone, dolomite, and gypsum. It is characterized by underground drainage systems with sinkholes and caves. So that underground drainage system and the sinkholes and caves that form are a pretty common sign of a karst landscape. 
a quick sidebar while, while we're talking about water soluble rocks if you remember when we went to white sands i mentioned that the way that the sand forms is because there's gypsum that dissolves from the mountains over here from the water and then it pools up down here and then gets broken up into or forms crystals and gets broken up into small bits of sand so it's that same sort of like water soluble rocks uh, getting dissolved and then forming these these cool landscapes connect a couple of threads there So I mentioned, okay, so, so first to talk about these, how do they develop? So you have this water-soluble rock under the, under the ground, but in practice what it looks like, and I'll walk through this as kind of a multi-part picture here. So it starts off where you have these resistant cap rock ridges, and so this would be, down this gray part would be the part that is water-soluble, but the cap rock would be something that isn't water-soluble, so like sandstone or something else. And then that protects the layers below from collapsing. And so that's a lot of what you see, and you'll see that when we fly over, even in the game, I was, I was pleased to find out that the, the landscape is so clear, you can see those sort of ridges and ripples. And you'll see that the water then gets underneath and can kind of get into the cracks here. Now, if it's something like a limestone, it'll have fractures by just the nature of how the rock forms. And so the water gets in between those, uh, those fissures and then starts to dissolve additional minerals. So that'll continue happening as more rain falls, uh, water will keep collecting underneath, and those fissures in the ground will start to expand more and more, until eventually it gets to the point where the, the rock that was underneath here has dissolved so much so that the ground above it just collapses. But in the places where you have those capstones, then you will keep that same sort of general structure, and instead what you get is you get these cave kind of formations underneath. And so you get the other thing that you get is you get these layers of, of caves. And so the reason that you have a cave that goes down sort of in these levels is because of the structure of the rock underneath. Same reason that at the bottom of a cave system you'll have sometimes a river is because the upper parts of the cave have already dissolved away so much and the water has dropped down through and is now at that lower level. Let me show what this looks like. Now this is kind of a busy picture, but it has kind of everything that you'd see. So when I talk about a karst landscape, it's things like a sinkhole that you might see, you might have some of these valleys that are in here. You'll notice things like the cave that we are going to be talking about, Mammoth Cave today, where it has a big hollowed out area, but there's a bottom floor that has a river that flows through, and then out of that that um, lowest level, you can see they label the water table here, actually goes down layers and layers as it's eroded down. And so the bottom of the water table actually pops out at kind of the river level. But there's that, that difference between the where the river's flowing and then the top of the ground is all potentially cave systems. And then of course as water moves, it, it dissolves the minerals more readily. A couple of other formations on here. We'll talk a little bit more about those. I'll pull up some pictures from, from real examples that'll, that'll highlight what that looks like. So where are the landscapes? I already kind of answered this in the poll, but they are all over the globe. Uh, oh, I should have left this up, actually. So you can see there's sort of uh, bits and pieces all over, but they really, really, truly are everywhere, which is really pretty cool, I think. So the world's largest limestone karst is in Australia's Null Arbor uh, Plain. In Canada, the Water Buffalo National Park contains uh, karst sinkholes. Mexico hosts important karst, uh, karstic, karstic regions in the Yucatan Peninsula. And South China karst in the provinces of uh, Guizhou, Guangxi, and Huanan uh, provinces are UNESCO World Heritage Sites for that reason. A lot of very famous karst landscapes. Ones that you may recognize actually as you, as you start to see some more. So that said, karst is most strongly developed, because remember, as long as it's water-soluble rock, then it'll, it'll develop, but karst is most strongly developed when you have uh, dense carbonate rock, such as limestone, and that's where it'll have uh, highly fractured sort of rock. And so uh, to contrast that, if you had, for instance, chalk as the rock that it was being built under, it's highly porous instead of dense, and so the flow of groundwater isn't quite so concentrated along fractures. So because you have porous rock, the water just kind of trickles through, 
Whereas if it was fractured, it'll start to develop flows, which then erodes out more of a, a cavern. It becomes an actual cave. That's the magic of, of Mammoth Cave and, and why it looks the way it does. It's also developed most strongly where the water table is relatively low, because then um, uplands from the entrenched valleys, and then when, uh, uh, sorry, when the water table is relatively low, and then where rainfall is moderate to heavy, because that'll create a rapid downward movement of groundwater, again, eroding more of the, the rock bed faster. I'm sorry, dissolving more of the rock bed, not eroding. So what kind of features do you find in these karst formations? There's all sorts of cool ones that you'll encounter. So in Mammoth Cave, one cool one is the River Styx. So this is the part of the park, this is where the river that flows underneath Mammoth Cave leaves, and that's what it looks like, this River Styx. And they used to have a tour that would actually take a boat from in there and you could just flow up the river a little bit. Uh, typically it flows out of the cave, but if there's a lot of rain, it can actually flow back into the cave and flood the bottom levels of the cave. Cool. Now that you know how they're formed, it kind of makes sense why that would be. You can also get fantastic versions of the same things, like this is a, a spring in France. Or you can get limestone pavement, so if a glacier comes along, smooths off that top layer and just leaves limestone, then you get these cracks that actually show up on the surface. So that's that same artifact, the, the fissures that I was talking about under the ground. You just see them on top if, if a glacier has pulled that off already. You can also get sinkholes, like I mentioned. So here's a, a particularly big sinkhole. And then you can get uh, c cenote. cenote. Uh, this would be a classic thing that you'd encounter in the Yucatan. Which also looks like a wonderful place to go for a swim, in my opinion. These are various degrees of ages of karst systems. When you get into the older karst systems, you had more time for the different uh, rock formations to dissolve away, and so you can get things like tower karst. So this is in China. It's the same sort of uh, dissolving of the rocks, but now given enough time, instead you get these incredible structures. There were um, so many cool photos of karst landforms around the world that I we could have done like a two-hour slideshow on them, I'm, I'm sure of it. But, but these are kind of a sampling of a couple of them. So if you want to check it out later, there's probably eight more structures that we just don't have time to get into. And of course, in caves themselves, underneath the ground, then you can get these sort of stalactites, stalactites, stalagmites, columns, and a bunch of other structures. We'll talk a little bit more about these in particular in a future stream, but it's the same sort of principle. Carve out a cavern and then the dripping water that comes through. So, okay, now that you know a little bit about karst landscapes, has anyone been to a karst landscape kind of place? So we talked about Mammoth, but there's other ones, maybe ones in uh, other cave systems, or uh, if you've been to, to those areas of China or uh, Yucatan or anything like that. I'd be kind of curious. I actually, I, I think I've been to another cave that was a karst system cave, but I've never been to uh, Yucatan or, or to the provinces of China where it had it. Now they're on my list, of course. Gotta get there one day. So why is it important? Why are the karst landscapes important? First of all, it exp explains a lot of the geological features you see in this area. And as we get closer to the park, you'll see you'll see that sort of like capped ridges, and then it curves down into valleys, and you'll see the structures. And there's potholes all over the park. You don't see them in the game, but but they're much easier to to find when you know what you're looking for. The other reason is the study of karst is important in uh, petroleum uh, geology because as much as 50% of the world's hydrocarbon reserves are hosted in carbonate rock. And much of this is found in the porous karst systems. So you may remember we talked about petroleum when we went to, uh, I believe it was Kenai Fjords. Um, but I'm sorry, now I'm blanking. But that's okay. One of the uh, past parks that we went to, we talked about uh, petroleum. And we talked a little bit about how it can get locked up in rocks. So now that you know how the carbonate rocks form those fissures, hopefully it makes a little more sense about why the carbon or why the petroleum could kind of hide in there and wouldn't really have a reason to, to get re released. Let me see. <laughs> fractals does mammoth cave count? Mammoth cave counts fractals. Did you fall in a sinkhole? I think that's probably the, the line for it. Sailor Guy, fabulous caves in Vietnam. Yeah, I believe I believe that they have a pretty a pretty cool system uh, cursed landscapes out there. Uh, that that was one that came up a couple of times. Carlsbad Caverns, Mad Wisping Girl, I like Carlsbad Caverns. 
That's a good example too. It's a very, I, I learned during the stream, Mammoth Cave is a little bit more, it's a big cave, it's a very interesting cave to go walk around for its magnitude. Carlsbad is a, it's a big cave too, but it's a little bit smaller, but it's really a showy cave. So Carlsbad Cavern is where you get your, your unreasonably pretty sort of rock formation in there. I will do a super quick detour on Fort Knox, because like I mentioned, we just have a quick layover here. So Fort Knox in real life looks pretty similar. fly by that. Hello, Fort Knox. Goodbye, Fort Knox. Okay. Oh, I flipped over to the... <laughs> sorry. I started playing intro music. So there's Fort Knox in, in the real world. Just kind of a fun little layover. I When I build the flight plans, I try to throw in some, some interesting waypoints for other flight simmers. A lot of the audience who downloads the flight plans for these are actually from Germany and France. And so, you know, for someone who, who's in the United States or, or knows more about the national parks, it would be more meaningful for the national park part. But for someone who just wants to see cool things in the US, it's kind of fun to have a bit of those, a bit of those hidden away. All right, and now we are on our way to Mammoth Cave. So karst topography is formed from the dissolution of uh, soluble rocks. It's characterized by underground drainage systems and sinkholes, uh, underground drainage systems with sinkholes and caves. The resulting formations can be truly incredible. And this is the year to celebrate how cool they are, because in 2021, it's the International Year of Caves and Karst. That can be your fun fact, by the way. Uh, 2021 is the International Year of Caves and Karst, if anyone's asking what's going to happen this year. It's a giant party for the caves. What I really liked about the Karst landscape, though, is how global it is. So, sure, Mammoth Cave is the largest cave, in, or the longest cave in the world. But the Karst formations and landscapes are found everywhere. And so it got me thinking, something that's kind of a global phenomena, something that would be of interest to other countries, something that would be kind of a unifying activity, maybe. What kind of thing would, would that be? And it occurred to me that the thing to do would be to host the Summer Olympics inside of a karst formation something somewhere right the karst summer olympics so think about it right what's more universal than karst formations plus you can have your swimming events in like the river sticks like we looked at and you can have your diving into the pools that you could tan uh, your track and field can be out in the fields of china like we looked at on and on and on and to top it all off if you find a pothole big enough you can even <laughs> So sorry. <laughs> um, to top it off, if you find a pothole big enough, you even have built-in stadium seating. <laughs> okay, but really, uh, formations is a common thread. Uh, karst formation, excuse me, is a common thread across the globe. Really resonated with me. It's a nice reminder uh, that we all on Earth have a lot in common, and it's a reminder to vote karst formations to host the 2028 Summer Olympics. <laughs> Speaking of sports. Our second topic today is a more unusual sport, um, but I would still consider it a sport. Uh, some folks would consider it an extreme sport, actually. And <laughs> okay, fractals. Uh, fractals. Thanks for that. Uh, and so our second topic today is caving, or splunking, you may have heard it called. Uh, or potholing, if you're from the UK, is another term for it. So, how many flashlights are recommended for caving? Is it two or three? It's always good to have a backup. Is it literally as many as you can carry? Or, flashlights are optional. Uh, your eyes will adjust to the darkness. Got one vote for flashlights are optional. Let people put in a little bit more here. I knew the I know the voting system's a little weird to get used to. So, thanks for giving them to try. It is cool though. I like that it's built into the chat. I think that's a little, it feels smoother as a solution than, than this kind of auxiliary system that was before. So caving. Caving and how it's connected to the park. So caving is a critical part for how we learn the true size of a cave and more about the ecosystems it contains. 
Also, for all of you who like your cave puns, or your puns in general, I'm going to ask at the end of this section for uh, cave puns from the audience. So uh, get your thinking caps on now as we're talking about it. See what you can pull out for, for good puns. OK, so what is it? What is caving? Caving is, oh, let me catch up on the chat. OK, it's a bunch of votes. That makes sense. <laughs> Fractals, yeah. It, it, it's kind of nice. You can see everyone else is voting, too. Not that bias is it, but I guess it's a. It's not really meant to be a, a high stress poll. Hope it's not a high stress poll. All right, let me try out this screen. Hey, look at that. So this is caving, or this is an example of caving. And caving is also known as spelunking in the United States or Canada, or potholing in the UK and Ireland. It's a recreational pastime of exploring wild caves, uh, which would be, a wild cave would be different from like a show cave. So a wild cave would be one that, that isn't just a tourist attraction sort of thing. The challenges involved in caving vary according to the cave being visited. In addition to the total absence of light beyond the ed entrance, negotiating pitches, squeezes, and water hazards can be difficult. So part one of that, that poll or, or option C on there of uh, you don't need a flashlight is not true. You definitely want to bring a flashlight into a cave because once you get past the entrance, there is simply no light. So much so that we'll talk in a moment about animals who have developed in caves that have no eyes because why do you need eyes if there's no light? And the correct answer on that poll was the one that got the most votes, which is two or three. So in the UK, they recommend two. In the US, they recommend three. Uh, I would go with three because... I like to have a backup. But you probably don't want to bring just as many as you can carry, because it is quite a quite a trek you're gonna be going on. It gets a little bulky. Now there's a different kind of caving that you might hear about, which is cave diving. So cave diving is distinct, is distinct, it's a bit more hazardous, and it's kind of a subspecialty undertaken by a, a specific minority of cavers. So you're more less likely to encounter someone who does uh, cave diving. There's an area of overlap between the recreational pursuit of caving and the scientific study. And at that overlap, the most devoted and serious-minded cavers become accomplished at surveying and mapping the caves and then formally publishing their efforts. So that map of the cave that I showed before that would be an example of one that's just through the efforts of people who have been to the cave enough times uh, and, and documented where the different passages go to then create that kind of map. Sometimes it'll be categorized as an extreme sport, although it's not commonly considered that by longtime enthusiasts, mostly because it's disliked, because it kind of implies that it's not safe. Uh, the response you'd get from a, a caver would be, it's as safe as you are precautious about it. So uh, anything can be unsafe if you're not being smart, which is a fair answer. Uh, but others do call it an extreme sport, so you, you can decide for yourself. Caving has also been described as an individualist team sport. Uh, and the reason for that is you have to make the trip without direct physical assistance most of the time from others, but generally you do go as a group for companionship or to provide emergency help if needed. So while it's an individual sport, it's almost always done in a group. Individual is a team sport. There you go. Others, uh, some also, uh, uh, cavers also will consider it though just a classic sort of team sport because uh, you kind of need to do it as a group, even if most of the activity itself is done on your own. So now that you have a little bit of background on caving, who all has been caving before? Uh, like either, there's the walking into the cave, but it really what I mean is actually putting on like a, a hard hat and a headlamp, I think would be kind of the, the amount of caving uh, in my mind. Has anyone gotten to do uh, kind of that, that crawling through tunnels or anything like that? They also talk about um, urban exploring has a lot of the same elements, so that I suppose also counts too. I did get to do a little bit when I was in the Boy Scouts. So I was a, I'm an Eagle Scout, I'm a proud Eagle Scout, and the I must have been 13 or so. We did a uh, camping trip where we stayed in a cave for the night, and so we brought uh, hard hats and and flashlights and went climbing through different passages and tunnels and stuff. It was pretty fun actually. I, one of the cooler camping trips that I would never have thought you could actually go camping there. Plus, you didn't have to set up a tent. Just, kind of sleep on the ground. <laughs> Assistant to the... Oh, you, I, I forgot you can read the chat now. Um, that's pretty funny. Uh, fractals, you did that in South Dakota. Cool. 
Was it like one of the the famous caves in South Dakota, or just a particular one? <laughs> Dial lens, no crawling for me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a particular flavor of activity. You have to you have to kind of want to be doing that sort of pop out here, so we can look a little bit around. Oh, well, there's flying singer. Hey, flying singer. As we get a little bit closer to the park, you'll start to see some of those karst landscapes that I was talking about. Look for the kind of... I wouldn't describe them as rolling hills, but it's really pretty clear. You'll see You'll see when we get to the area that's that's got those capstones and, and the cave land. A fractal. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Fractal's pointed out a really good point, which I don't have in the show notes, but if you ever do go to a cave, Remember that there's limited oxygen in a cave, and so if you light a fire, that is a way to use up all your oxygen. So that's a pretty a pretty dangerous thing to do. There was old... They used to store um, liquor underneath the bluffs where I went to college. It was like an old... I don't think it was for smuggling, but it was sort of like a storage for the local bars or something back in the... I don't know how long ago. long time ago. And we went down there because it's just sort of a cave you can go exploring into. And we went down there and... I remember having this thought, I, my, my dad had told me probably eight years earlier or something about like, you know, don't light a fire in a cave because, I don't know, safety stuff comes up in the Boy Scouts. Oh, probably from the camping trip we did in the cave. That would make sense. Um, and I remember having this thought as a, it must have been 20 or 21 uh, year old walking into this cave going like, oh yeah, I could see a bunch of 20, 22 year olds, uh, you know, the two years older kids. Uh, getting in here and, and drinking and lighting a fire and, and having some, some serious problems. So that would be a good takeaway for today is don't light a fire in the cave. Oh, uh, Islas uh, Meritas uh, Nublados Trace. I'm pretty sure I said that wrong in Mexico, though. That's pretty cool. Go through the uh, the island there at the, the Hidden Beach or something. I actually looked into that beach because it's a... I don't have a picture of it, so I'll, I'll make this super short. There's a famous beach in Mexico where there's a kind of hole around the rim, and then there's a beach in it. And my thought was, oh, maybe that's a karst formation that is this uh, sinkhole that occurred in the ocean. So I don't know, just kind of curious what it might be. Um, but it turns out that it's not what it's from. It is from the uh, local government was testing out bombs. And so they blew a hole and formed a beach. So that's a different way to get a sinkhole. Uh, Nublado's Trace, that totally counts. Kirkshire Caverns in Arizona with hard hats. Ah, cool. Ah, oh, Sailor Guy, brother and sister are big cavers. That's cool. I didn't know that. Very neat. Uh, but no crawling. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Alright, so here we are coming up to... Actually, we got a little bit of a... a little bit of a flight still. Okay. I got some uh, feedback in the survey, which we'll post at the end again, to try and time the the live stream so that I have the, um, when there's pictures, that it's when we're not seeing things in the park and vice versa, so that the full screen is when we're at the park. Which some parks I can do, like this one, other ones a little bit more tricky. But. Okay, so how do you get into a cave? I'm sorry. Um, oh, yeah, so so why would you want to, why would you want to go caving? So if you're Nylans, you maybe don't want to go crawling anywhere, but exploring a cave is still kind of fun. And you you might do it just because you enjoy the outdoor activity or the physical exercise. It's similar to mountaineering and diving in a lot of those respects, so there's some overlap of kind of reasons you would want to do those things. The There's also physical and biological sciences that are important, and then others engage in cave photography, which is a pretty a pretty fun way to go and explore a cave. The other piece is that unexplored cave systems comprise some of the last unexplored regions on Earth. And so there's been a lot of effort put into trying to locate, enter, and survey them. So when you think about places that we haven't been yet on Earth, uh, caves are kind of a lot of, the, a lot of the list, and a lot of them would be potentially undiscovered. Excuse me. Good reason to travel all over the globe, too. So how do you get into a cave? How do you get out of a cave? Some caves you can just walk in. Others you need to drop through a hole though, so you need some way in and out. There's what's called a single rope technique, where you just drop in and then you kind of like scrunch your legs and pull yourself out. There's a similar rig, looks sort of like this, dropping into a cave. 
And then the other thing you could do is you maybe just be lowered in. So if you're going into a, a big cave, so this is a hardwood hole, you could just be lowered all the way down and then pulled back out later. And then as far as equipment that you need, it's really just the stuff you have lying around from your work in the boiler room. That was a bad joke. <laughs> it's <laughs> You pretty much need uh, kind of a hard hat, coveralls, a helmet mounted light, boots. And you'll notice he has, uh, this guy actually has three lights on, uh, but you'll be, you can pick out two pretty easily. There's one in front and one on the side here. I think I mentioned this in a past stream, but I learned a lot of uh, my flight training was in Wisconsin and uh, kind of the more rural parts of Wisconsin. And so I I keep having a the same thought I did then, which is like, I have no idea where in this state. I, I This is when I had an instructor. He was teaching me how important it is to keep track of where you are, which was a good lesson. And I remember having this thought of like, I have no idea where in this mess of farms and fields I am relative to anything else. Yeah, so I keep looking around and going like, like, oh, we must be close now, right? Um, but anyway, funny black bag. The other piece that you may want for your equipment is knee pads, uh, extra gear, emergency supplies, that sort of thing. Now, if you're in a cave and you get injured or trapped, there are cave rescue teams that are highly specialized, and they have to do this blend of sort of... Uh, it, it uses a lot of skills that you would need for like a firefighter or a caver in general. So often these are people who are cavers and, and will join these emergency response teams. The cave rescues are slow, deliberate operations that require a high level of organized teamwork and good communication. The extremes of the cave environments, the air temperature, water, vertical depth, dictate every aspect of a cave rescue. Therefore, the rescuers must adapt skills and techniques that are as dynamic as the environment they operate in. If you want to learn about how to do incredible teamwork and communication under stress, I would recommend looking into how cave response teams operate. Because they have, uh, they use the incident command system, which is an, an entry point for you, which was originally des designed for uh, wi uh, wildland fire teams, but it's now used by a lot of agencies around North America. And each agency kind of modifies the approach of the incident command system uh, to their needs. But caving in particular is a very, it's very interesting. And it's interesting how they have, because you have to have someone outside the cave who's kind of running the entire operation, someone in the cave who's then responsible for everyone in the cave, uh, as well as, you know, all the different aspects, how do you do public relations of the incident, how do you do those sorts of things. I won't go into a ton more detail right now, but but if you're interested in those sorts of things, um, then that's, it's a, it's a pretty cool way to, to learn about it. Yeah, nah, nah, lens. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. There, yeah. There's a pretty famous one in the park. Uh, if we have some time at the end, I'll, I'll talk about um, Floyd Collins, who was a, a famous cave incident here. And as Nia Lenz pointed out, there's a lot of YouTube videos and a lot of hype. It's the same sort of thing with airplane accidents, where when it happens, it's such big news. Um, whether or not it happens that frequently, it doesn't matter because it, it gets so much hype. Okay, well, it turns out that at Mammoth Cave, there was uh, Floyd Collins got trapped in a cave in the 1900s. I have it written down somewhere. Uh, I can pull it up, but it was the first time that radio was coming into people's houses. And so it was the first big radio spectacle. And so he became worldwide famous because it was the first time that this kind of information could be available. So, so totally, totally happens like that. All right, you're starting to see some of those karst formations. So you're seeing a little bit more of these kind of capped hills and the ridges, and they've got some depth to them. Actually pop out the right window here. We're going to pass the Nolan River Lake in just a moment, and that's that river that feeds into the park. So once you've gotten to the point of getting into the cave and you've got your protective equipment on, what do you want to look for? So one thing to keep in mind is that the cave ecosystems are very fragile. Uh, many of the... Uh, spilothems, which is this sort of thing, and again we'll talk about that in a future stream, uh, can be damaged by even the slightest touch and some are impacted by things like breath. Uh, cave dwellings themselves are also very fragile and often uh, particular species of animals can only be found in caves, nowhere else in the world. For example, the Alabama cave shrimp. Um, another one, like the eyeless fish, which is 
uh, discovered in Mammoth and was the first eyeless, creatures, uh, eyeless creature discovered. Are accustomed to near constant climate temperature and humidity, and any disturbance can be disruptive to the species' life cycles. Though wildlife, uh, though cave wildlife may not be immediately visible, it's typically there, uh, nonetheless present in most caves. So when you're down there, just be very cognizant of the the animals because they are definitely not used to people being around, and it can be pretty pretty disruptive for them. All right, so that uh, is sort of a, a quick introduction to caving as a as a sport, as an activity, as a hobby, however you want to think about it, as a thing to watch others do uh, through, I don't know, however you want to do that. Um, so while I wrap up here and do kind of my, my in summary section, uh, does anybody have any of those cave puns ready? Go ahead and throw them in the chat, and then uh, by the time I get through the summary, I'll... I'll read some of them up. All right, so caving, splunking, and potholing, or potholing, however you want to call it, is the recreational pastime of exploring wild cave systems. It's a challenging sport and requires a mix of disciplines to excel at. The most devoted and serious-minded cavers become accomplished at the surveying and mapping of caves. Actually getting in and out of the cave depends on... Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, actually getting in and out of the cave depends on its structure, uh, but the basic equipment is always similar in the, the flashlights you need, that kind of thing. And remember, two flashlights is smart, but three flashlights is American. And of course, once you get down into the cave, you're greeted by incredible formations, formation and unique ecosystems. All right, let me, and our person of the week is Stephen Bishop. I'm gonna pull up a, a picture of him so that we can look at him real quick together. This is Stephen Bishop. He had some real curly hair. Um, talk about him in just a second. And then I'm going to flip back here and kind of pop out so you can see the whole landscape. So this is the Nolan River. I'm sorry, Nolan River Lake is this part of it. And this is just north of the National Park. And I'm actually going to overlay here the surface map so you can see there's the cave system of Mammoth Cave. So here's the cave system of Mammoth Cave, and we're going to fly. You can't see much of it, but it, but it it'll be more apparent than than you think. Uh, and we're going to fly right over kind of the main part of Mammoth Cave as we turn from New Cave Entrance to Visitor Center. So as you look on the, on the game at the maps here. Uh, well, I can start off with my own pun, which uh, maybe someone already said in the chat, but uh, what do you call a fish with no eyes? A fish. All right, what else? Uh... <laughs> Fractals. Uh, cute. Oh, I forgot you can all read them already, but I'll read it anyway because it's, it's fun. I just read an article about a frozen caveman found accidentally by hikers in the Himalayas. They found Himalayan in the ice. <laughs> Fractals, what do you call a kid that searches for gold in a cave? A miner. That's a good one. <laughs> Nevada's choice. I was nervous about going splunking, but eventually I caved. Cute. Fractals, what pants do you wear in a cave? to leg tights good good stuff all right uh and i'll throw another one of my own in so you know what they say be careful when you're caving because you may end up with your arm or leg in a karst why don't parent <laughs> why don't why don't parents live in caves parents live in caves are too much of a bird den that's funny uh, yeah, we can do that. Okay, so let me point out real quick here this karst landscape. So you can see this kind of deep river valley cut in here as we're starting to get into the park. And that's what I was talking about, where you can really see it. You can see it more than you might expect. Let's see if I can get a good angle on this. So as we're flying in, look, and you can see sort of the ridges and the depths, but also the capped 
stone where it would be non-water soluble stones and then it drops off and goes beneath. Alright, so I'll stop swiveling around the game so much. But So Fractals posted up the which park are we exploring together next time. Uh, we have Pinnacles, Death Valley, and National Park of American Samoa. Realizing that people can really bias the results because you get to see what everyone else is voting for. Have a fun little, little back and forth on it. So I mentioned Stephen Bishop. He's our person of the week. And why this person for this park? So Stephen Bishop was a mixed race person who was enslaved for, uh, and famous for being one of the lead explorers and guides to the Mammoth Cave in the United States, uh, sorry, in the state of Kentucky. So Bishop was introduced by Mammoth to Mammoth Cave in 1838 by the man who enslaved him, uh, Franklin Gorham, uh, who purchased the cave from its previous owners in the spring of 1838. There's that karst formation again really see it now the game is doing this funny thing where it's not rendering the trees i have not figured out why that happens it seems to only be in patches of mammoth cave uh, so you can see a bit of the actual landscape where otherwise it would be covered in trees i don't know why that is so after he had already explored all that had previously been discovered of mammoth cave bishop began to grow bored within the cave he knew there was more out there but uh, with a, there was a limit on how far experienced guides would go. So the furthest anyone had been is to what's called the bottomless pit. Oops, I'll keep the pole up here. So this is the picture of the bottomless pit. Uh, it's much deeper than, than it shows here. And so no one would dare venture uh, near the pit for fear of being lost forever in its depths. The bishop was brave and his curiosity was greater than his fear. So along with a guest who was equally as curious and dare daring as Bishop, the two men journeyed into the pit. They laid a cedar sapling across the gaping mouth of the pit and slowly ventured across. Remember, at this point, they wouldn't have had flashlights or headlamps on your head, right? And so, if I remember correctly, they're holding in their mouth sort of a burning torch system to make sure that they could see things as they're crawling across this cedar sapling. What the two men discovered, opening up uh, what the two men discovered on the other side of the cedar sapling, on the other side of the bottomless pit, opened up a whole new part to the cave. A short way further from the pit, uh, Bishop. Uh, a short way further from the bottomless pit, Bishop discovered a river. This was the first body of water that had ever been encountered in the cave. Ever been encountered in the cave. As he explored the river, he found fit eyeless fish, psh, something that no one, had, no one had heard of at the time. This brought scientists to the cave to study the new creature some of the most popular areas of the cave were both discovered and named by Bishop uh, after crossing the bottomless pit. So brave, daring, stupid, call it what you want. Uh, that's why we're talking about Bishop today. Now Bishop in his spare time explored and named large areas of the cave, doubling the known map in a year. He began naming um, so sorry. He began na he began the naming tradition of the cave, and is the reason why we have uh, this sort of like half homespun American, half classical terms, things like the River Styx or the Snowball Room or Little Bat Avenue or Gorin's Dome. So he's the one who started that tradition of Mammoth Cave. He also discovered uh, the strange blind fish. He discovered snakes and silent crickets and the remains of cave bears, along with century-old indigenous gypsum workers quite a set of discoveries. All right, Fractals, does that close out our, our poll then for next time? So what I did here is I slowed the plane down real good so that we'd have plenty of time to talk about things. And then <laughs> it wasn't moving fast enough towards the end. So we'll, uh, we'll fly over the park. We can get through my quick rough estimation so for this is uh, for flight is the app I'm using and you can hover your hands and it'll just tell you how long it'll take you to fly different areas so for the last couple of minutes here what I'm going to do is pull up the the park and you can kind of see that that karst formations that topography that we we're talking about I'm going to put away the cave system so right now we're over mammoth cave because I want to show you uh, what different parts of the park. So this is Crystal Cave, and so we're going to do just a, a bunch of different photos of, of the park. 
So Nolan River Lake was that lake that we first passed. So that's what that sort of looks like. And then there's Great Onyx Cave, which we passed just a moment ago. So this is another cave that's kind of in the property you can go and visit. And then the entrance to the Great Onyx Cave is a little bit more built up than the other entrances. There's Crystal Cave, which we just flew over a moment ago. So that'll be just back here. This is the entrance to Crystal's Cave. I mentioned Floyd Collins. So Floyd Collins is the one who discovered and then started to monetize this cave. The other one is the Frozen Niagara entrance. So this is what the Frozen Niagara looks like. It's kind of the more fantastic part of the cave that you can go and visit. And of course, when you go to visit, then you should do the, well, there's a bunch of different tours you can choose from, actually, so I won't, I won't tell you which one. You have to, to research and decide for yourself. Uh, but on the Mammoth Cave Tour, one of the entrances, uh, one of the tours will take you to an area like this. And you can go and see the signatures on the ceiling of Gothic Avenue. And you'll notice some of the dates on here are like 1819 and 1821 and old, old signatures done in smoke. There's stalactites and stalagmites that you see in the cave, as well as formations like Mammoth Dome. There's the bottomless pit we looked at earlier, the river sticks, a bunch of other ones that you'll, you can go and see. We're coming up on that new cave entrance now. Like I mentioned, you can't really see much in the game, but once you see the landscape, it makes sense why a cave would exist there and how that could even make sense. And... There's Violet City is another piece that we'll be passing here in just a moment. This is what the dripstone and flowstone in Violet City looks like. I can only find a black and white photo that was any good. As well as the historic entrance. So this is the, I think this is the one I walked in, so I don't know how long ago it was open, but this is what I remember. And then the Green River, which is the river sticks empties into the Green River. Looks something like this. And you can see the high hills off in the background here. We'll fly over that in about two seconds. All right, so got about two minutes here. So I saw the vote for Pinnacles National Park as the winner, which I'm very excited about. I uh, uh, Pinnacles is, is a particular favorite of mine. Um, just. It's got the California condors. Oh, I won't spoil all the, the fun things, but it's, it's got a lot of a lot of cool stuff going on there. So that'll be a good time. Let me get my sign off here prepped. And we are coming through the visitor center area. So you'll see the visitor center off to our right, and then we'll pass right over the river green. I'll let the stream keep going for just a minute after I, uh, after I close out. The only pieces that are remaining are sort of the flying along the river. And then the landing here is actually really pretty. So for those of you who are are flying along, I would highly recommend trying to, to make a landing at Lakeview if you can do it. Kind of a short runway, but it's a fun runway. So with that, today we talked about Mammoth Cave National Park. We talked about karst formations, as you can see all around us now. There's that visitor center down below. We talked about, and the river Styx is like right off our nose now. So that's where that that water from the cave flows out. So we talked about the karst formations, we talked about caving, we talked a little bit about we talked a little bit about Floyd Collins, we talked a lot about Stephen Bishop. Uh, Fractals just posted up the survey, thank you Fractals, uh, also for the Discord and for Twitter. So survey is great if you have any input or suggestions, especially with a couple of changes, uh, the higher resolution, the new layout of the formats. Um, always, always appreciate the, the input there. Uh, Discord's great if you want to come hang out in the community. We talk about national parks, flying, posting things, just generals hanging out. And then Twitter's nice if you just want a notification. You get a heads up about where we're going. And with that, I'm excited to explore Pinnacles National Park with you all. So thank you for being my co-pilot today. And until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. And I'll see you all next week. Like I said, I'll let this keep flying for a minute because it's it's just pretty, uh, and then I'll I'll kind of sign out here. So I'll be on the the chat if anyone wants to chat. Otherwise, I'll mute the microphone.